Welcome, greetings, I am Christian and this is Lazy Devs. This is our tutorial where we make a roguelike. So I haven't been recording for quite some time now. There have been like a lot of like things that I have to do in my life that I had to take care of. And today I want to record a little bit. It's very late now. I've been not been doing nothing just but but nonsense all day. And people are getting nervous in the Discord. I like it. They're kind of like, oh, what is the next episode coming out? So, what we're gonna do today is... So we have like this this, this guy now and he is doing some really good... Colli um, um, not collision detection, but... Um, pathfinding. However, there is a bit of an issue there where we saw this, how he kind of sticks, he prefers to go left and right before he goes up and down. So, so you sometimes can get like into this weird dance where it's like... Doo, 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 doo. And the only way to get him out is to kind of like move out and you know, that kind of like these kind of stalemate situations is something that we want to avoid. First, two things that I want to take care of. Um, so we're here in a tools function, I think... Was it Tobias who said this? I'm, I forgot who said this. I'm sorry, I'm, I, I haven't wrote it. I actually did write it down, but, but I displaced my, my thing. So here in the LOS function... Oh, that's actually in gameplay. Uh, there is something I did not optimize. What did I not optimize here? This. And this. Good. Little opt little optimization here. Second thing, I I forgot I forgot all this time. I for I somebody mentioned this and was like, oh, I will fix it next episode. And I just just completely just. So it's here in UI. Um, this is really embarrassing, but. Do you remember we made show message where it's like it pops up a little message and that message disappears after a certain amount of frames? And then we made a second thing where you, it shows a message and you click it away. We um, we called them the same. This is both a show message. So what happens in this kind of situation is the second function overrides the first function. So f uh, the first function actually doesn't really work anymore. It's just only the second function. <laughs> <laughs> it's awkward. <laughs> uh, so I guess um, so. Like we didn't notice it because the um, oh man, I deleted it. Uh, this um, this guy here, the the stone slab is. I think we had it had it here. Is uh, we removed it and we didn't have uh, actually any. Yeah. Okay. So we have this, but this is not show message. This is this is the this should be the you know the T message. We have to like figure out some good name for this show. Talk, show dialogue, show um, click awayable message. Um, let's call this T message, show T message, like for or for talk message, talk window, right? Or show talk, show, let's go show, show talk. Uh, so this now around, this time around now, it actually doesn't work anymore. Um, Oh yeah, because um, this um, this show message accepts different kind of variables than the show talk. The show talk wanted to have a um, array of um, of s array of strings, whereas a show message wanted to just have it like a string. That's fine. Um, let's go to gameplay and fix this. Show show in here instead of show message. We're gonna go show talk. We probably will remove them very soon anyway. It doesn't matter. Okay. Good. So, next up, we are going to return to this... Um, to this pathfinding function. Or, it's not really just a pathfinding function, but really just like how the AI character uses this pathfinding... Um, uh, this, this map, this pathfinding... A map basically and how they use it to pick up uh, pick where um, where they go next so there's uh, there's uh, there was two comments that I wanted to comment on <laughs> so one comment was from Matthias and he was kind of like um, fr um, expressed some frustration with him kind of like losing track of of some of the program stuff and for for a while having like a bug that I didn't have and then him trying to kind of like figure out what the for the bug was 
and um, him being like really concerned about me copying functions. And I really understand that that's one of the reasons why I generally like to want to code as much stuff live with you guys and copy as little as possible. I always feel bad if I like have to look at the my previous code to kind of like figure some stuff out. Because again, like you don't see the process of me figuring it out myself. So like, you know, code comes from nowhere. It's like, how did he arrive at all those things? So I, I get that, that criticism. However, I will warn you, there's gonna be at least one function or like one function at least that I, or function combination. There's like one function and like follow-up functions, uh, like a structure that I wanna be copying from my other program because it's kind of like a tool that I, I, it's actually not something I, like usually I, when I copy stuff, it's usually not something I would be able like to easily code from scratch. Uh, and it's usually something that is not really um, tightly linked to the gameplay itself. Not, not necessarily something that is like really the game itself, but more something like a helper tool that I often, when I do work on these kind of things, I copy from already existing code I already have myself. So that's why I had like this tool tab and most of the functions that we copied are in this tool tab here, you know, like fading or, um, or you know, waiting or, um, or like creating this blank map. I guess that, that, that's something I coded. Um, also like in this get, uh, in this gameplay function, this, you know, uh, line of sight is something we copied over and, um, yeah, and fogging and stuff like that, stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, so I didn't mind so much about copying this one out because again, this is not something I would code myself. And also because it's not something that you kind of have to understand how it works. So if you are, um, if you are getting lost in a program, I, that's probably not because I copied this function because these are not really changing anything about the structure, about the flow of logic in the program. They're really just like these utilitarian functions that do a specific thing. It does exactly what it says on a tin and nothing else. Um, so if you are getting lost in the program, that's I think the, the underlying problem might be uh, somewhere else. Uh, and you know, that's kind of like very natural. You see me coding the stuff. You don't see me struggle with, uh, with issues. And usually, you know, I edit this stuff out where I like sit there and it's like, wait a minute, why is it not working uh, for a couple of minutes? So generally I, I have like huge advantage because I'm coding this for the second time and I'm able also to edit out the parts where I'm, uh, where I get lost myself in here. I don't have everything I'm here in my head myself. So uh, mistakes happen as well. So don't worry about that if you get lost yourself. However, um, uh, it's very important. I think when you having bugs is to have, kind of have like a healthy attitude about how to solve them. Um, and I think um, I've been dealing with this a lot because it's, this is actually also something that happens a lot of video games where you're playing like an adventure game and you can't solve a puzzle. And there's something that very, that's very dangerous that happens in this situation where you can't solve something when something like stumps you. Um, I think we as humans naturally, and I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not very different. Everybody's the same. Um, we tend to, at some point, shift our thinking into more rationalizing why it's okay that we are stuck rather than trying to figure, put ourselves in positions where we might be able to come up with, with a better solution. So at some point it's a, a start about, you know, finding somebody to blame or, um, or rationalizing why this, why this position sucks so much for you. Like being like really some working yourselves up into explaining why this is so horrible. Um, and rather than actually trying to um, use this energy, you know, this mental um, energy to kind of like figure out a way of, of trying something else that maybe you haven't tried before. And so um, that's something I would definitely recommend working on, or at least um, I think it's an important step if you just notice it yourself. Just noticing is, I think, often just enough to diffuse the situation where it's like, wait a minute, I'm just here, I'm just like mulling over why it sucks so much and that doesn't change the fact that it sucks. Um, but uh, maybe, you know, there's a, there's a better way of going about this. That's quite often people suggest when you're like doing puzzle solving, like, you know, like solving generally puzzles, you know, like in adventure games, a uh, very helpful, but often advice that not people often take is just to take a break and just walk away and do something else, distract your brain and return. That kind of like resets your brain and the brain is no longer focused on solving, uh, on explaining why, why this sucks and this is like, and more about, you know, having like a fresh start and actually trying to come up with a, uh, with a creative or with a, with a with something that pushes you maybe to some 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 new situations. Uh, generally, programming is not something that you can watch somebody else do, and like yes, I, now I understand everything. You actually have to sit there. You have to actually, 
you know, figure it out yourself. So, you know, um, you just watching this video, that's just like a small part of the whole picture of trying to learn programming. You actually have to do it yourself, sadly. I'm sorry about this, guys. I cannot, I cannot change that. If I could, I would. Um, so yeah, like if you're getting stuck, that's fine. I know like copying the code at the end of the episode is always a bad solution. That's kind of like giving up. That's kind of like looking up the solution for the puzzle. Um, it's, I think it's necessary for you to guys to like really jump in and try to debug it yourself. I might be able to help you if you're in Discord. That's a very long uh, conversation. The second comment I, I had was from, um, from Lori and she suggested that um, you could tweak this pathfinding function for in multiple ways to achieve different results. Um, she definitely suggested that, that you could use the same dist map for every uh, enemy. And as I said, yeah, that would be normally that would be the case, but actually we cannot do it anymore because every enemy has their own target. And um, so their targets are not, not in sync anymore. I could maybe keep track of, you know, which target uh, I calculated on last time around. If the target didn't change, then I can like keep on reusing the same, the same disk map, but that would cost additional tokens. And all, all that it would change is like it would make things more efficient. Uh, and it's I'm not suffering under lack of efficiency. Like this is not a very complicated function, so that's fine. I don't need that at, at this point. If I'm feeling like the game is like really uh, chugging and, and, low, and running at a very low frame rate, doesn't feel smooth, then I might consider it. Uh, and second th suggestion that she had uh, was also like um, now you could like for example the way we did this is we just didn't consider a walkable and unwalkable terrain. Um, like we just considered walkable terrain, we didn't consider unwalkable terrain. So it was either, you know, this is like one step because, you know, this is walkable terrain or if it's a wall, we just didn't consider it at all. Uh, but she su suggested that you could uh, now count things maybe that like um, vases, like vases or enemies, you could count them as having um, requiring multiple steps. So enemies could break vase if it's, you know, if it really helps you, helps them a lot or they could open doors. If they, if that, that would really save them, you know, ten steps. So you know, opening a door would cost them ten steps, and, and um, that way they could behave in a semi-intelligent um, fashion, just using the distance map. That's kind of fun. Um, I feel like for a different game that would make more sense. In our situation, um, I don't want to actually the enemies to interact with uh, to like break vases themselves. I think this is not good. Um, the vases are for the for the player themselves and and so once you start getting into situations like this i think you will quickly get um uh, i'm worried that enemies would start like opening all the doors and breaking all the vases because you know they're like on the opposite side of the map so it seems like a useful thing for them to do and then you walk into a room and all the rooms are empty because all of the fun things have been already interacted with by the enemies. That's not to say that I don't want to have things happening without the player actually reacting to it. I think it's a fun thing of RP of roguelikes if there's like things happening um, on their own, like there's, there's like um, enemies interacting with the environment in unpredictable ways. I think that's cool, um, but I think we don't have those kinds of elements in yet. I think when we get into traps or triggering some things, then I think I might be interesting to kind of consider what enemies can do with that. Nevertheless, like her comments are like on point. This is exactly how you would do it. Absolutely. Long explanation. I'm sorry for, for this being a more of a talky episode. There's just a lot of things that we have to sometimes discuss. There's like a lot of really good comments and I want to be like really be able to, um, to respond to them. Mm. Good team. So we already talked in the last episode why the player prefers going left and right. And that's because they are looping. We're looping through our here, we're looping through dear X and dear Y. And um, our goal is then to find the best, best distance and best, um, best direction. So um, it's more likely that they will find their best possible move, either going left or right. And then even though going up and down would be just as good, they will ignore it because they already found the best move left and right. So the solution for here would be, um, there's multiple solutions, but I kind of like this kind of solution where it's like uh, we go instead of just going um, randomly, uh, going in the same um, order through all of the directions, uh, is to create kind of like a candidate list of good moves. And then you can pick a random move from the good moves, from the best moves. So that's something I want to be doing now. 
Um, so let's try to do that. So this is best distance bx and by. We might actually doing something something different here. We're gonna, we're gonna do something like um, we're gonna call do use a local variable and we're gonna call this can just candidates, and that's gonna be this. And um, we don't keep the, we will keep this um, best distance. I think that's good. But we might not need the bx and by. That's something we're gonna figure out later on. So uh, if distance is smaller and or equal, that's important, equal and best distance. Let me think about this real quick. Um, so here you would, you would find the best distance. Yeah, okay, so if the distance we found is smaller than best distance, then something special happens. And, uh, and then else, um, and then we're gonna go if um, dst, equals best distance then and then something happens so if we found a new best in this case we want to actually um, clear our candidates list then all of the other candidates we found are are for not we kind of like we found a distance that was 10 away now we found a new distance that's seven away all of the 10 candidates are not interesting anymore now we can move on <clears throat> and in this case BDST becomes distance. And so here um, we can then add to the candidates list um, x equals um, dx, y equals dy. So we're adding a new candidate to that list. And, you know, it's a bit maybe a bit elaborate situation because you co probably could use a similar um, have a similar situation where you just like scramble the directions in which you look and you just you know find um, <clears throat> you uh, just walk look through all of the directions in different order. That would be also do the same thing. But I kind of like this candidate solution because we're going to use a similar um, pattern a lot of the times when we do random generation where you just like instead of like f trying to find the perfect formula to find you know the thing and then doing some kind of like random number generation to kind of like scramble this around. You simply list all of the possibilities and then pick a random number from that possibility list. And that's often a good way to rent, to pick a good, something that fits your criteria, but it's also randomized. Um, okay, so now we adding those candidates list. And then once we're done with this, uh, we're gonna go, so if I'm um, gonna at first want to make sure that the candidates list actually contains something here. So if hashtag canned uh, is greater than zero, then we actually do this, and uh, and otherwise we not we actually not working. Uh, return true is something we do in here, but we don't do it in here outside. So if we haven't found a good candidate, we're actually not walking. And remember this false and true thing here. The returning false and true um, defines whether we actually activate this animation at all. Because if, we, if no, of none of the characters, enemy characters has moved, then we don't need to actually do an animation for them. So if, um, if there, we haven't found any candidates, if actually our list of candidates is bad, for some reason or another. For example, uh, it would happen when an enemy is trapped, so there is actually no way for them to move. In this case, they actually cannot move, and their candidates list would be, would be zero. That's fine, then, then not to walk. But in this case, it's not zero, and so now we have to grab a random candidate from the list, and that's gonna be a new, um, new tool. So I want to be using a, um, I'm gonna create a new function. I'm gonna call it get rnd, and then it's gonna be from an array. So it basically returns a random entry from an array, whatever array it will be. It, we will use this a lot. Return uh, r, now um, we need to go one plus hashtag r, uh, rnd, Hashtag R. Let me think about this. So if the array is one long, yeah, that, that's correct, right? Yeah. Um, this is wrong, not this, this. 
if the array is too long, then it's going to be an R and D two. That's going to be something between one and zero. Ah, one more thing, uh, floor, R and D R, hm. like this. So basically, you know, we just like um, looking at how long an array is, and then with this kind of formula, we are kind of like randomizing a number between one and the length of the array. And that will give us um, a random entry from an array. Okay, so here we have to be something like, um, we can go <coughs> local c equals get rund canned. And then it's gonna be c dot x, c dot y, like so. Um, there's one more th problem that I have here. Um, the BX and the BY, we don't need those guys anymore. Um, the can't we can actually put up there. We could define the can't here, local can't. No, I don't want to do that. I actually want to define it here so we don't have never have a nil can't. That could be really bad for downstairs. So let's do at least a can't. Okay, let's try that. I'm here. So what we should see now is the guy going. Yeah, now he actually goes. He actually went straight for my jugular. That's good. Uh, hopefully he will go left at some point as well. No, he actually goes always straight for me now. Interesting. Was it just like random chance? Ah, okay, now he moved randomly. Okay, good. So this adds a little bit of uh, unpredictability to the enemies, but I think that's fine. There would be another solution for this um, where to make it more predictable, but also to make the movement of the enemies more predictable, but also more smart. So you saw like previously we had this problem that the enemy was really far away uh, in term in like in vertical direction. He was very far away in, in the Y direction, but he's not really far away in the X direction, but he would still prefer to first, you know, align himself with me on the X axis rather than actually closing the much bigger distance of the Y direction. So something you could do is actually factor in the, um, uh, no difference in y and x and trying to reduce the biggest distance uh, on first. So kind of if he's already close in the x dimension, he would actually try to go up and down first before going left and right. That would make, in, make, make in their movements a bit more natural and they would be more predictable um, they, So because there was no random random generator involved. Anyways. So this seems to be working. Um, this is actually really good. So let me think about what to do next. Is there anything uh, dramatic that we need to be fixing? All right, yeah, I want to maybe uh, kind of like test the behavior of how um, this guy behaves when there's multiple enemies involved. Because what we will have quite often is um, we will have quite often a situation where there's like lots of enemies and, you know, usually the solution to uh, kind of like finding lots of enemies in roguelikes is to put them like uh, in close quarters so you're always finding one enemy at a time not like a, a million of enemies at a time so i want to um spawn a bunch of enemies to see how they behave when there's like large groups of them and they cannot get to me mm, something like this let's try that uh, also at this point we could also maybe yeah i want to see if if they yeah, like something like this. So they can like have a second um, route around. So they're gonna try to approach me from here or if they're actually gonna go, go around. And you know, generally like what will happen. Okay, so we triggered a bunch of enemies here and they're all going in my direction. And some of them going sideways, interesting. No, they're going, going back. No, yeah, okay. Yeah, this, this makes sense actually. I do, actually don't want them to try to approach me from the back. I think that's that's because what will happen then is they will be on their way um, up there 
and then suddenly you know I killed an enemy so suddenly this path is clear again so they will start going forward and it's blocked again so they will so go backwards so we'll be caught in this loop constantly depending on how the what the what the only route is so um, so I want them actually to ignore other enemies I want them to try to go through this and uh, through through this and realizing oh there's actually like this is the best path but it's just currently blocked by an enemy so I will pick some other move that is like not pushing me too far away from my current position so I can like hang around in, in this and just there's just something I don't like about this where it's like oops oh it's fine it's fine yeah it's kind of weird how this guy doesn't move actually no I guess he doesn't see me let me give me a lot of health points. Um. Something like this. Yeah, he didn't see me. <laughs> it's funny. No, the other ones also cannot see me. Why did... Oh yeah, because he, I'm outside, outside of his sight radius. That makes sense. Good. This seems fine. Uh, there is like generally like a bit of an issue maybe I can talk about here where it's like I will probably change the way that the gameplay works. So the, the way the gameplay currently works is uh, you can you can wait. There is no wait button, but if you bump the wall, you will see I will kind of like skip a turn and the enemies get gets a turn even though I haven't moved. I kind of like in, there's like an empty interaction with the wall I can always do if I'm next to a wall, and that gives me an ability to wait for a turn. Um, I figured in testing that this is a bit boring because you kind of like do can do whatever you want. Like uh, in such a situation. It's kind of easy just to bump the wall and I, I can attack the enemy immediately. I can always get myself in the optimal position to attack the enemy um, without any kind of skill or, or figuring out something, figuring out like strategic positioning. So what I will actually um, do is I don't want um, the player to be able to bump the wall to skip a turn. I still want to like a small animation to play there, but it won't give the enemies a turn. So the only way for you to um, to actually do skip a turn to is to actually do some kind of interaction. For example, opening chests, opening doors, things like that would um, would actually skip a turn. And this creates like very interesting in strategic situations where uh, you often get a, you want to position yourself perfectly against the enemy. For example, like here, where it's like okay, if I move forward in here, the enemies will get a free hit on me before I get a hit on them. And if I move backwards, you know, the enemies will still advance. So um, so I haven't actually changed my positioning compared to enemies. I just maybe retreated a little bit, but still, I'm still in the same position where I, my next move is towards the enemy would be de detrimental to me. Um, and so I'm trying to find a situation where I can do something like this, where I don't move and the enemies have to move. And so they will get like in a position where I can now attack them first. Um, and that's generally something called Zugzwang in Germany, uh, or at least that's a German term that is often um, used in chess. Um, there's often like the same similar situation where two kings in an endgame where um, you have a situation where actually moving is bad for you, but you have to move because it's your only piece. Um, and you know, if you follow this logic to the end, there's like some really interesting strategic consideration of who is like an advantage to who's an advantage, disadvantage, depending on the specific distance between two kings and um, the arrangement on the board. And yeah, that creates like this wealth of interesting like puzzle-like quality, where it's like, oh, I have to figure out how to move myself to the left so I can get better positioning. Um, the term that I so often heard in roguelikes is priority kind of fixing priority is often something that you have to do so yeah i kind of want to have like a similar game mechanic in here where i'm uh, where the goal of the game or like this one strategic component of the game is trying to fix um fix um zugzwang or fix uh, parity with the enemies so you can get more of an advantage when attacking them or you can just like you know expose themselves to their attacks but that costs you uh, life points
That's kind of like what's my idea. I'm not going to implement those kinds of stuff in here just yet. That's just something I want to, to, to mention now because on the next episode, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to actually dive into the inventory system. Um, <clears throat> so maybe some words about that. Um, I think like one of the big, big important aspects of RPGs are um, inventory management systems where you can like pick up stuff and then equip it and maybe use it. Maybe like there's like health potions. So I want to have like a similar system here where there's like a menu where I can do some very simple item management, inventory management. I want to have like inventory system of around six slots, like um, six different items that you can carry around with you. And um, I want to have like a very simple equipment system where you can equip two things, an, a, a, a weapon and some kind of armor. And those will attack, um, modify two stats, attack and, and defense. Um, so yeah, we kind of have to gonna have to think out, so, uh, come up with some kind of inventory system or some kind of like UI system that allows us to do all of the manipulation of inventory that we will have in this game. And again, it's because of like this tutorial is supposed to be like this kind of like vanilla role playing kind of tutorial. So we go through all of the motions. We're gonna go through all of the systems that usually uh, we have in RPG systems. Uh, if I was to make this kind of game myself, and like this was my game. I would be probably questioning the idea of an inventory system. Uh, I would probably look for maybe some more organic ways of integrating inventories. If you want to look at games that are kind of like roguelike-ish, um, RPG-ish, but don't have inventory systems, uh, I think a good example of that is something like Spelunky. Or I think, I'm not sure if Binding of Isaac has that, but Spelunky for sure, where you there is like items that you can pick up and items that you can equip but you never push a button to pop up a menu where you're managing all those items. They're kind of like all naturally, um, the way you pick them up and the way you use them is kind of like ma naturally embedded into the movement and, and interaction system with the world. I like that. Um, but you know, this is not the kind of game we're making. We're making like a vanilla, um, hammy RPG. So we're gonna have to have inventory systems. All right, guys, so this was it for this episode. I want to remind you that you can get this beautiful Token Limit t-shirt in this new store that I opened. It should be down in a doobly-doo. You should check it out. Uh, keep those comments coming. I love them very much. And if you want to uh, join the discussion about the game, lots of, lots of people are rewriting the game, make some really cool experiments. They actually wrote, I just saw today, they wrote the pathfinding function recursively and they were able to, able to save like 30 tokens or something. That's that's exciting. So if you want to check this out, go uh, downstairs. Also, uh, there's going to be a link for the Discord. And as always, there's going to be a code for this episode, um, uh, also in the Discord, uh, in a doobly-doo, I mean. See you next time around, guys. Bye-bye.